Hello and welcome back to the Age of Bison YouTube channel. This is Sure Shark Dead again, and we are coming with another civilization spotlight. So we've currently covered, I think, three civilizations: Sweden, Spain, and Portugal thus far. Pretty well received. Um, I think those videos, um, if you're interested in um, kind of figuring out what this playlist uh, or series is all about, go ahead and watch those videos as well. Where we're kind of doing a deep dive individually into each civilization in Age of Empires 3 and kind of giving a, a broad overview of the strengths and weaknesses, building a deck, and going over standard opening build orders. This is a series that's primarily designed for new players, people who are maybe picking up the game free to play. Um, but uh, if you're also trying to learn a new Civ and you've been playing that one Civ, let's say on the ladder or amongst your friends or against the AI, and you're like, oh, let's pick up something else. and you're finding it a little overwhelming, then this series is going to be for you. So in this one, you can see already that I have up is Russia. So I'm joined here by Pistol Pete. He uh, has been a long-standing member of the Sun Bros Discord, um, a member of quite a number of tournaments, and has shown his medal um, across the ladder and um, in those tournaments as well. And so he has been a great resource for all things Russia. So he is going to be kind of taking us along and guiding us on um, this kind of classic sieve uh, that's just been here since the beginning. And so, you know, welcome in. Thank you for doing this. And I wanted to just immediately open with a question. So I think uh, people already have a sort of indication as to exactly what Russia is supposed to do. Like lots of units, throw them at the opponent, overwhelm and win. Um, traditionally, the sieve has been known as a rush sieve, age two heavy rush. I, I like to think that maybe that's still part of the character of it, but would you still classify them as an age two heavy rush sieve in a 1v1 scenario? Would you still approach them that way as a player, or do you feel like the character of the sieve has changed a lot now in the DE days? Sure. Well, uh, real quick for everybody's benefit, Pistol Pete. I'm about 1400 ELO with Russia, so they're our top or even better players out there, but I've, I think, made a reasonable name for myself in the community playing a lot of Russia. Um, and I, there's, and I typically just, I've just kind of done standard Russia builds, although there's a lot of unique things to try. In terms of whether Russia remains Kind of an early rush civ uh, that's kind of been its identity throughout uh, age of empires they've introduced some new um, aspects in de recently here but i think the core identity of the civ still remains the same although there are some fast fortress options and even fast industrial options that are out there for russia but i would say the primary reason why Russia's main identity is as an H2 Civ is because a lot of its units are decent in H2. Uh, Russia's able to get a lot of units out early, a lot faster than another other Civ, so you want to take advantage of that bonus. Um, and maybe even more importantly, a lot of Civs get access to their core or stronger units, the, the units that they want to make up the main composition of their army in H3, and they come out of the box shadow teched as an H3 unit, where Russia doesn't really have any all that many units in H3 that are, um, come in the veteran status. I think the only one now is the Cap Archer because of recent changes to the Halberdier, which they now call a Porochik, is. Uh, uh, now available in H2. So, uh, I would say, yeah, I would agree. Russia's main identity remains in H2. So. Okay. Um, let's go into just sort of the, like, what are some unique civilization bonuses, if you want to classify them as bonuses. We'll get into units a little bit later when we're building the deck. Um, I understand that Russia has plenty of unique units, and, and they'll be dealt with in turn. Um, but, you know, what are some of the, like, if I'm first time playing Russia, I'm sitting down with you, what are some of the things that like I need to know right away about the Civ as a whole 
in terms of what makes it unique from the other ones that players should be made aware of. I think the first adjustment that a player would need to make as opposed to saying like a bread and butter sort of like French is uh, units train in batches. That includes your villagers. They train in batches of threes, but they're cheaper and the production time is a little less. Um, same thing with your military batches. They get produced a little bit faster, but you have to make all five of them. Uh, for example, with a musketeer, you have to make all five of them at once, whereas if you're Brits, you can queue up one musketeer and then finish the batch as it's getting towards the end of its uh, completion. That's a big adjustment. Um, let's see. Uh, I think that's one of the main... Uh, remind me of the question again. I got so concentrated on that thought. You, you want to know the unique attributes of Russia? Yeah, so like you, you mentioned, yeah, the batch training, right? So like for settlers, right? And then for the military units, for sure. Um, and then are there any other sort of unique aspects of the Civ, certain Civ bonuses that okay, a player yeah. would need to be made aware of? I think that's the primary one. Um, another one is that, uh, similar to a few other civs, um, its barracks is a, called a blockhouse. It kind of behaves similarly to like a Haudenosaunee war hut um, in that it's a barracks and a tower in one. Costs a little bit more, 250 wood. Mm -hmm. But importantly, you can actually start constructing that during age one. Uh, which no other Civ can start building their barracks uh, in age one. So it's it's a, it's an aspect of your Civ that you want to lean into and take advantage of. Okay, so that really opens up the rush potential then, right? So like if I, I can send out some Vils in the middle of age one, already start to try to take map control, and then the minute age two hits, I'm, I'm can train units and, and send and send units to that to that blockhouse, right? Because because it, if it serves as a tower, it can also serve as a military shipment point. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right. It's a shipment point. So it really allows you to be able to get your units and really high up the map and exert pressure right away. Okay. All right, cool. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get into it now with the deck. Um, I wanted to, you know, we, we can definitely start talking a little bit more about the units and, and just different aspects about it. So the way this part works um, here... I have a test deck, okay? So imagine I, I come to you, Pete, and I say, hey, um, I'm about to get on the ladder with Russia, and um, I have a test deck here, and I'm, you know, I just want the standard land build order for 1v1. And um, so I'm gonna go by age, and so we'll go age one, two, three, and four, and then you'll just tell me what are the, what you feel are the required cards in each age in order for me to build a standard 1v1 land deck sure yeah um i'll i'll share with you the most popular cards through each age and then maybe we can trim it down from 27 to 28 down to 25 because then it becomes about personal preference sure at that point so if we're doing a land um i would say 90 percent of the time your first card is going to be distributivism uh, which is that one, yes, correct. Okay, so that's going to give me a wood trickle. So now, why is that so important for Russia to have a wood trickle? This seems to be a little bit different than most civs. Yeah, I mean, most civs usually have like a three vil card in age one, which Russia doesn't have access to. Um, so the next best thing in a 1v1 game is to get a wood trickle and... Uh, I think it like it counts for like two and a half ish bills on wood, which you know it's it's close to three bills, but not quite. But the good thing is it never goes idle. It's just a constant trickle, and sometimes those can end up being a lot stronger than three bills if if uh, for some players if they tend to let their eco go idle a decent amount. Okay, gotcha. All right, interesting. So, any other cards in age one? I would say a lot of players like to go for uh, the rider on the pony there. Um, yeah, Kamchatka? Kamchatka expeditions. Okay. Yeah, this is can, a lot. 
Uh, yeah, so it could be a nice card for... Gives your cav a little bit of a buff and a little bit of an extra line of sight. Uh, Russia can tend to be in an extended age to play for quite a while, so that's another means to beef your cav and it's, it provides a line of sight to kind of help you with your rating, which can be pretty helpful when you get to age 3 and have Opri running around the map. Okay, yeah, good, good, then, good point. And then for me, because I'm an eco-oriented player, I like to have economic theory in there. Okay, and that's just a flat 10% buff on pretty much all gather rates throughout the game. Yeah, and as a Russia player, I think you can... If you're in age 2 and you're starting to run out of cards to send, if you're around 35 to 38 bills, you can think about sending that in there because it'll be like a 4 bill shipment. Nice. And it'll just scale as, as the game goes on. I think kind of Russia's um, comfort zone is a really long age to play with other civs and so that card can come in handy then or even towards the end of the game where you have maybe 80 villagers and can send it then. Okay, gotcha. Uh, anything else in age one? Uh, that's I think the most typical things you'll see. I think like for some water maps you might see 300 wood in there to like do a dock start or something like that. Even some players, I've seen some advanced kind of players use 300 wood as a means to kind of get their block house up a little bit faster, but these are, I think, are the more standard uh, cards that you'll see in Age 1, and for me, I, I, I personally just use Distributivism and the Eco Theory in there. Okay. All right, so then we'll move into Age 2, where really it gets very fun, um, and you have a lot of options here, so... Um, Let's let's get into it. What let's uh let's see what the standard cards here are for H two. Yeah, again, a lot of flexibility, kind of depending on your preference. But I think everybody's gonna have the five Kazak card in there. Uh, it's a card that I think if you're gonna exert early pressure, this is the card that you're usually going to send first. Um, for a couple of reasons. Um, if you think of just like a resource of value that you're getting out of a card, like a Kazakh is 75 food, 75 gold. You multiply that by five, that's 750 resources. Um, at most age two cards are, you feel pretty good about if you get 700 resources in there, you're actually getting really good value. Okay. with that card in there when you send it and it gives you because you're building a forward blockhouse when you set your military drop point to that forward blockhouse it allows your cav to get in there quite early into your opponent's base and maybe you can pick off a vill or two or even just create some idle time it can make it pretty efficient and it gives you uh, a nice diversified army early um and probably with kind of Russia's age up in that Kazakh, you can get those Kazakhs in there like, I don't know, maybe five minutes a little afterwards. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So immediately a whole batch of, of Cossack, a whole batch of hand cavalry just right on your opponent, which is which is pretty nice. Yeah. Um, so does that mean that I also have the four to follow up or? Uh, here it's personal preference. I do keep that in the deck. Okay. But sometimes players won't have that if they want to take it a different direction. But, gotcha. Uh, I tend to have it. Um, so the next card, like, if we're just kind of doing like a standard Russia build, um, it, like typically you go in there with your five Cossacks and maybe a couple of muskets, and then if you feel like you've contained your opponent pretty well, you can follow it up with 700 wood. And this is something to kind of just make your rush not an all-in type of play. So what you'll do with this 700 wood is you'll typically lay down a second blockhouse next to your first one. Um, and that's going to make it pretty difficult for your opponent to push into your forward base. Um, keeping the forward base and that, that focal point of attack. Uh, on your opponent's going to put them under a lot of pressure. Um, 
to a second blockhouse. Usually, I drop a stable in base. Um, in base for two reasons. One, so your opponent doesn't scout it as easily, and two, if you do happen to lose your forward base, um, it means that you're not just you're not losing all your infrastructure, you're losing just your block houses and you still have a stable in base and also your opponent can tend to raid you. Um, and so having your cap pop somewhere in base to be able to kind of nullify or deny those raids I think can be helpful, but if you want to be more aggressive you can build the staple forward. And then usually with the remaining wood, what you do is you build some houses to kind of improve your housing space and uh, if anything's left over then a TP to kind of help get keep your eco rolling get get some shipment tempo um, other players may just be content to keep the block houses in there and maybe just take the TP line with that 700 wood shipment but I usually like having the cabin there to have a little bit of flexibility in your army to be able to respond to different problems that your opponent will throw at you okay Gotcha. All right, what's next? Um, I'd say you definitely need 700 gold in there. Actually, let's talk about let's talk about two cards before the 700 gold. Take the 700 gold. Out. All right. So, um, so if you're doing a st st typical build, distributism, five Cossacks, 700 wood. Um, a card that you could throw in here. <laughs> You can go in two directions. I think what I'm seeing the stronger players do, and I'm experimenting with it a little more, is you put 700 food in there. Interesting. Okay. Yeah, and I never would have, um, never would have like considered doing that, and kind of the reasons are obvious. Um, food is faster gathering resource than wood or gold, so you'd prefer to kind of be sending wood or gold um generally speaking than 700 food but the challenge with russia is just it's units everything is so food intensive and so sometimes you're really struggling to just to get enough food out there for you to be able to keep up constant villager production and um uh, and military production at the same time, and you don't want to idle either of your military production or your, or your uh, your town center. So the 700 food kind of helps give you that one last kick, uh, I would say, to your eco, so that you can maintain both military and villager production. And then afterwards, you should you should have enough villagers, you know, assuming you haven't been raided too hard or something like that to be able to generate enough food um, uh, afterwards uh, to, to keep keep production constant. Okay, so yeah. you're treating 700 food as a sort of like potential shot in the arm basically for the player in order for them to you know, like you say like, okay, this is 700 food. I mean, you can make quite a few batches of vills and then also follow up with even more military production to, to stay on your opponent. Um, but it, I guess it would just come down to a timing thing, right? Uh, right. I mean, just usually you're struggling with Russia to get enough food in there. And if you're like, I mean, if you're thinking about like with the 700 wood, you've, you've dropped and had two barracks two barracks is two block houses and a stable and your bills cost 260 your stretlets cost 375 food and usually even if you put all your bills on food you're just not going to be able to keep all of those buildings producing i see um so like you, you don't want it so to the extent that you can kind of fill in that food gap you can keep all those buildings uh producing and not idle so like even though like it seems counterintuitive like there are more valuable cards that you could send than the 700 food in terms of not idling either your military production buildings or your eco it actually uh, does good things for russia so um any but um yeah so that's one approach that you could take uh, with this card, the other card that I wanted to talk to you about and talk 
too bad that I kind of I often spent was a, it's a sent kind of in, in kind of a typical build was you sent spice trade. Okay, interesting. So, I think if you're learning Russia, you can play with um, either the 700 food or the spice trade to kind of see what works better for you, uh, or what, what kind of what what will work better for you. I'm kind of wor working through it myself, but spice trade's a great card for Russia because, like I alluded to, it's an extremely food intensive sieve, and spice trade's going to improve uh, the gather rates of your villagers on all uh, natural resources so that's hunts and berries particularly nice on berry maps where berries like have a terrible gather rate just in the game right. in general but spice trade actually makes berries a little bit more viable for um, uh, in the game in terms of the 20 plus 20 percent gather rate and the other thing that it does is it um, it gives a higher yield on those resources so uh, a hundred, uh, you know, a hunt with a hundred food on it is going to actually have 120 food on it because of the 20% yield. So it allows Russia to remain on hunts a lot longer. And interesting. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of tricky. You get more value out of out of it the sooner you send because of that. The sooner that you get that higher yield kicking in, the longer your natural res are going to. Uh, stay in on the map. So in a typical build like where you're just suffocating the opponent and not doing an all-in I'm Which is kind of the build I'm going for here spice trade is a great card to send here So which one would you take then it sounded like you were saying one or the other they're two different routes You know for the purposes of this of this Exercise which one are you taking? I mean, I think You got to kind of read the situation spice trades a little bit greedier um, in that, it's. I mean, if you have 15 to 20 bills on food at that point as Russia, you'll feel like you have maybe 80% of your uh, eco kind of gathering food. 15 to 20 bills is kind of the same as like a three or four bill shipment, plus the higher yield. So, and if you think that your opponent's not going to go immediately to H3 and you you've crippled them sufficiently spice trades a, a little bit greedier card and get, gives you a little bit more kind of longevity in the game as opposed to kind of a shot in the arm like the 700 food does okay gotcha okay um i don't know let's let's say let's leave the spice trade in there then um but with the understanding that you could go you could go either route so but yeah, uh, sure. you know, well, like like you said, you're you're playing with it. Other players are playing with it. So if you're watching this and you're like, well, I'm building the deck. I'm building the deck. Okay, great. Well, know that spice trade is is one of a longer economic option, but may not necessarily help you with your tempo in the early game versus the 700 food. So for the purposes of this video, I'm just going to leave in the spice trade as an as an option. But this easily could be substituted for 700 food um, as a sort of like a as Pete said, just to maintain the production for that that amount of time. So, um, what's next? Uh, 700 gold should be in there. Um, I, you know, again, it's a shot in the arm uh, for you produce units. I mean, I, 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 I mean, it, at this point, this could be a 700 gold that helps you go up to h3 or 700 gold where you're using it to just produce a lot of cossacks and more more ruskets um out on out on the match but you know 700 gold's a card that probably every sub has in there to kind of help them get to h3 so you'll want that in there certainly okay but um let's assume that we're going for the really extended h2 play so a couple of cards that are going to help you with that are continue to maintain production get some infrastructure on the map you want to have 600 wood and 600 gold out there okay so we got a lot of resource cards okay yeah yeah i mean those will help you drop down teepees the woods like you can really block house the map get really good map control line of sight it makes it difficult for your opponent to push with 
push certain areas in the map without siege weapons. So, um, the 600 wood kind of helps you continue to put that infrastructure out there and build houses. Housing space is pretty expensive for Russia because its units are, are cheap. Right. Okay. Yeah, good point. Yeah, like, because you're training in batches, you're you're going to need the housing. So definitely the extra wood, extra coin for units. It's good. Um, yeah, that, that's training, exactly. Housing is tough to keep it keep it, keep it under control. Okay, so are we... Are we going to go for Unique Church or Advanced Arsenal or... Um, we can talk about the Unique Church. It's not something that I've included in the deck, but um, I think kind of what I would put in there is like that inf the, the shield with the axe and gun on it. There mm -hmm. was called the New Order Regiments. Um, so this is a card that's going to beef all your infantry or at least the... the Oh no, it does impact the Borachiks, uh, the Halberdier, Russian Halberdier. Mm -hmm. But that's a buff to all your infantry, and that was a recent change that card didn't used to be in there because they kind of split the Boyer's card. But, um, you know, I, being a team player myself, I wasn't too happy with that change because I liked to do Cossacks and Strutlets in team games, but. For the purpose of 1v1s, I'm kind of coming to find that I actually really like this card because uh, Russian muskets are just such a weak um, unit. I mean, to kind of put it in perspective, I think like once you get the veteran status on a normal Russian musketeer in H3, it actually just kind of gets you to the same place that a standard H2 French musket would have okay so if you're gonna have a composition that's gonna be really musket based it's kind of a nice card that makes that unit a lot more efficient so it's a good card to have in there okay yeah good point um are there any other cards that we can add in h2 i think we can add one more maybe um i, I think we need to take up every space in h2 because you'll in, in an ideal game everybody's playing in h2 forever okay. um but uh, you'll want to uh, forget what it's called. Uh, next to the three grenadiers, all the way at the end. What is that card? What is uh, the... To the left. What is that? To the left of it. Boyars. That's it, Boyars. So that's a card that buffs all your cav. Yeah, ten percent across the board. Cav archer cost second. Upper tunic. Yep, that's the one. All right. So, so same again... thing as the new order regiment, right? So this just gives you. The longevity for the calf. Yep, exactly. Um, another card that we didn't talk about. You want to have the thirteen strutlets in there. Sweet. That definitely needs to be in there. Uh, again, another military shipment. Strutlets are uh, a skirm unit with very low range, but um, very cheap, very efficient unit. One of the, used in the right way it's one of the best skirms in the game and they're food and wood correct and you train them in batches of 10 kind of like the uh insurgente right yeah i think it's a 375 food and 100 wood for um 10 strutlets so very uh, cheap so one strutlet is basically around 37 38 food and 10 wood Jeez. And if you think about like, if you think about um, that as compared to like a Dutch skirm, which I think is like 50 food and 65 gold, this is a great way to be able to get rid of heavy infantry at nowhere near the the expensive price that other civs have to kind of invest in resources in terms of making skirms. Okay, gotcha. All right, so an, a unit definitely to look out for, maybe a big part of your composition. So if you're learning Russia, Strelitz, Strelitzy, um, very cheap, very, um, like not very combat effective in the sense of like the individual unit stats, you'll be, these guys will be getting mowed down, but they're massively cheap. And so you just keep sending them and then you just keep winning. So I think that completes age two. So let's go ahead and move into the fortress age. 
Um, so did, I, we use, did we use up all the cards in H2 real I, quick? Just to test. I, yes, we did. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there's nothing else that can be put in there. Mm -mm, we can switch yeah, some things out. Yeah, and I mean, just it's personal preference. Like, people will do different things. Like, sometimes they'll put in like advanced arsenal or something like that for the late game. Things like that, um, but uh, oh wait, is that a space trade? Did you t remove? I, I, I removed. I removed space trade for that. Ah, okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean that people will mix and match a deck that works for them. But I think this is a pretty standard deck for Russia here. Okay, and just and just to clarify for everybody, you know, make multiple decks depending on the situation as it arises. As you become more skilled as a player with a sieve. And their matchups, you'll start to realize, like, okay, I'll have a deck for, you know, if this Civ is doing this thing, then I'll have some answer to that. This is going to be an extended H2 sort of, you know, sort of deck where you're probably planning on rushing. You're going to be, you're going to be taking the map and then eventually, you know, you're not going to be intending to age up very quickly. So this is, this is kind of a sort of standard, but as Pete said, like, you know, feel free to play around, spice trade. For 700 food, you can switch out the four Cossacks for Advanced Arsenal. There's plenty of ways to, to kind of go about it. So Yeah, we, we should probably talk about the church card. Okay, yeah. There as well. I, it, it's, not, it's not something that I've incorporated into my builds, but a lot of um, strong players will use this card to their advantage, or if, if they have like a fast fortress build. I, I believe if you send that card, it gives some unique improvements available in your church and like one of the things that you can do is um, uh, w for a certain cost you can upgrade pretty much all of your units across the board um, which can be pretty pretty nice if kind of you get to age two with a large composition of a bunch of units and you can just research one item and get a discount on uh, upgrading the units across the board as opposed to if you individually um, upgraded each one um, so that's a, an option and I think there's also like an option for like you send that card you go to kind of in a fast fortress type build uh, you go to uh, age three you research that card and you chop a thousand wood and then you're able to get like eight or nine Dragoons, mm -hmm. uh, which can be used to kind of, you know, I mean, for example, if you're playing Spain or something like that and you're expecting a lot of Lancers to come at you with an H3, that's a, kind of a nice option to give you give you some goons in a, in a more fast fortress type of place and people will use it that way. But for me, I'm just kind of an H2 enjoyer and if we're just talking about a standard deck, you could, this is kind of what I'm looking at. Yeah. Um, I believe those Dragoons you're talking about, too, they're counter Dragoons, so I, I believe they counter all Cav, not just not just heavy hand cavalry, but they also they also counter other Dragoons, other range light cavalry, so, and then also really? they have, I didn't, I yeah, didn't know that. I believe so, cool. mm-hmm, and then their age 4 option is gonna be, um, not Pandors, um, or maybe they are, um, oh, I think they're like counter Jaegers, where they they're skirms that counter other skirms, mm. so and you get quite a few of those. So it's it's a pretty sweet thing, and like you said, the upgrade, the upgrade cards as well. So definitely, like you said, like you know, there's there's some options where that's going to be incorporated into it. But I think you probably have to build a deck around the around the church card rather than just like have it in something like this. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Okay. So what's in here? H3, it looks like we got a whole bunch of stuff. So yeah, there's a lot of different ways that uh, you can go for it. I mean, I think two Falks is pretty standard. It's one of the best H3 shipments in the game. Um, because 1v1s tend to be a little bit more unit oriented. Russia as a Civ is usually struggles to deal with cavalry um so either um you could either go for five cav archers or you could have um the manchu in the deck i think a lot of players go for the manchu 
there's some decks that I have it, some decks that I don't. It just kind of depends on what Civ you're playing against. Okay. Gotcha. Let's, let's let's I go. Suppose, I, I suppose some people will use both the Cav Archers and the Manchu, but you know, five ca ca Cav Archers are at least free, so it's safe to have that one in there. So, what are Cavalry Archers? These are Russia's goon unit, so uh, the most European civs get a goon, but Russians and Ottoman get a cav archer, which is your anti, you know, your mounted anti cavalry unit, and um, it's got some advantages and disadvantages. The goon has a better firing animation, so you can kite and fights a lot more. Cav archers are a little bit more slow to fire but in a stand-up fight they tend to beat goons because they have a lot of hp um so kind of when used properly they can they can be a solid unit okay yeah so something to look out for also as players like know that your goon is going to be the cav archer and then they're going to be higher hp so more of a stand and fight kind of unit rather than kiting uh like goons are so maybe a little less micro intensive so yeah, well, I mean, I'll at least want to stand up fight in a better way, yeah. No. Because that's less micro intensive in a way. Okay, what's next? Um, like six Cossacks make sense to have in there. Um, I like to have the 13 Musks in there, but others will prefer to have the. 19 stretlets in there to me uh, <laughs> we can see kind of where the deck ends up here uh, to me the stretlets are usually just so cheap to make that i'd rather just produce them and sometimes you just want a lot of anti cav out there as russia and so i prefer and a lot of times i have a musket oriented army and if i really need something that's anti-infantry oriented then that's what the two falconets are for uh, but okay yeah i mean at, at this at this point kind of we're getting down to personal preference on some of these things but um uh we can get into some of the other like unit shipments that can be done as well but for me I like having refrigeration in the deck. Okay, that's surprising. Russia. Um, no, I I think this is it makes a lot of sense. Russia is such a food intensive sieve, um, and I find that if you know between that and eco theory, um, if you ever get into a late game, between those two eco oriented cards, you probably should just win. Uh, well, you know, I'm thinking economic theory and then spice trade and then you add, well, refrigeration, oh no, is, okay, no, refrigeration like you said, oh yeah, oh no, it's hunted animals as well, so, all those yeah, three together. Wow. Yeah, it's, 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 it's on everything, um, and uh, you can, I don't, I don't think you need to send that if you're still hunting, but if you're starting to make the transition from food or from hunting to mills um uh i mean just from like if, if you build two mills you know that's not like getting in six mills right there if you send it if you have if you and normally you need like three mills at least as russia so it's like a nine bill shipment if you have three three fully staffed mills working for you nice okay um let's see um i think you want the stretlet combat card in there okay that's 20 percent. that's pretty it's pretty decent yeah it's i mean if you're going into goon skirm composition then the stretlet really uh, kind of helps your stretlets make it just to, just so many things to kind of make that unit more and more efficient we already mentioned how um, inexpensive it is, and then you start put tacking it up, it can be a real handful for your opponent. In the absent, like if they don't have like heavy cav or um, cannons, that they're able to kind of get on top of those those units. So. Okay. Let's see. Um, I like having six opri in the deck. 
it can be difficult kind of if you're kind of constantly brawling to kind of squeeze these in from your stable because usually your stable you need to kind of have it be oriented towards um, uh, producing Ozaks or cab archers and then kind of having these being able to pop out maybe even like at a forward blockhouse um, like uh, this is a card that like honestly can win you the game if you happen to find some vills kind of somewhere on you know 10 vills on the side of the map that you get on top of so I mean if you're new to Russia Opries are a very uh, specialized cavalry unit that in combat don't really offer you too much even if you get them on top of like skirms but they have a lot of attack bonuses against villagers against buildings and artillery so um, in combat I guess you could say that you could use them on, on artillery only they've got an attack bonus there but really kind of this unit is intended to kind of go attack your opponent's like, economy like they built walls to protect them though real rip that wall down and kind of get, get into that Okay. opponent's eco and if and we'll take down eight to ten bills pretty quick and usually a lot of times can tip the game in your favor interesting okay so something to be looking for if you're watching this that the oprichnik is a cavalry unit that is specifically meant for raiding um for killing bills um for getting into your opponent's base and, and taking down their economy so you know squeezing these in having these in the deck is, is going to be useful if you can raid with them yeah um, let's see, I mean, I, I think, um, two other cards that you send kind of when it makes sense, you have a thousand wood and a thousand gold in there for infrastructure, if you want to, like, make more falconets or something like that, those okay. two cards make sense. Um, and then for me, you, that's, a, that kind of wraps it up for me in H3 and we can go to the industrial. Okay. I don't know if there are other cards that we should think about talking about. Any. <laughs> well, I mean, but... I mean, you do have, like you said, the eleven ported chick, and just to, you know, they're the halbs. I, I mean, I, I think about um, um, this used to be really good. I, I if I remember correctly, the Sovnia, and then there's also the, uh, ransack. I don't know if you want to talk about those cards. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of, kind of player preference. I mean. Ransack allows your infantry to do a lot more siege damage. Uh, to me, I think you've got Opri, you've got artillery, you don't need to necessarily kind of mix this one in there. I'd rather have a combat card on my cap. Oh, there should be a calf combat card. We need to put that card in there, calf combat. There it is. Yeah, yeah. so that that's something that boosts all your cavalry in there. Um. Yeah. And the Sovnia so, is, is what? Like, that's... Yeah, that's... Uh, it's an interesting card, and, uh, you know, uh, it used to be really strong, particularly in team games, but in a 1v1 context, I'm not sure it's the best, but what it does it, is it gives um, your Cav Archers um, and your Stratlets a little bit more uh, oomph for attack when they're fighting hand cavalry, so... Um, if Russia is a traditionally weak civ to cavalry, um, and you kind of find that you're unable to protect your strutlets as much as you'd like, you can send this card, and it kind of doesn't make it a free exchange for your opponent. Like if they just get their heavy cavalry on your strutlets, makes them a little bit more robust into cavalry charges. So. Okay, gotcha. So again, just just some cards to point out, just for preferences' sake, you know. Um, so and there's a bunch of other things like, you know, there's some unit switches in here, and among other things. But you would say that this is this is about it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then going into industrial age, we only have two cards left. Yeah. Um. I mean, for so this is just for me and my deck. Um. That card in age one i just wanted to point it out because um, a lot of players i know have it i don't like to have it i'd rather have an extra card in age four okay um so for me i mean you have the two factories in there uh, certainly um 
and you know this is a kind of a tricky one and like i mean i think sometimes like i even take out an en another card in h3 um to squeeze another card in in h4 but i mean like conventional wisdom is like if you go to h4 you're going to get pressed and so you should have like two heavy cannons in there to kind of be able to push back the pressure or something like that and a lot of players would do that i think what i've tend to do i, I mean I, I, there's a couple of different decks but i think kind of in my standard deck what i actually like to have is the uh it's left of the halberdiers there the port porter chicks uh, that one Stratler Stratler board. board yeah so you take the two heavy cannons out um, in this deck anyways, and you put Stretlet Horde. And so what that's going to do is every block house that you have on the map is going to pop five Stretlets, and then it's going to give your Stretlets two additional range. And that, I, I, sometimes I find like the Stretlet is like, can be really handicapped, a handicapped unit because of its range, but getting the two additional range on the unit, that sheep can be really nice. And so it, in, in that sense, I, I don't know, it's kind of like me not being decisive and like whether I want uh, kind of a, a more eco or like kind of combat unit efficiency oriented card or something that, um, uh, or, or just as, I, I, I kind of view it as kind of like halfway between like something that improves you the efficiency of your units and being combat oriented because you get the pop of all the stretlets that can help you like defend against a push, but it, it makes those units more eff effective with the extra range. I just find it it's a good card to have in there. But um, depending on kind of what you're expecting the composition to be in the game, you could switch that out with the two heavy cannons. Um, or the other one, if you're expecting to be really a musk heavy oriented game, you could put Yoder's toy soldiers in there. And Piotr's Toy Soldiers, um, it, it gives all your muskets 15%. Um, is it just hit, hit points and attack? Yep. Is it, or is it just hit points? Hit points and attack. Yeah, and so and then that's really a great card because if you between uh, the Piotr's Toy Soldiers and that uh, the not the Boyars but the other H2 infantry card. Um, Russian muskets are starting at a pretty low base, but with those two cards in there, you're kind of looking more into like kind of the profile of a normal musketeer, except they're a lot less expensive than what a British musketeer would be. So that can be a really nice card if you're okay. expecting that really musket oriented, but musket heavy uh, composition. Okay. Yeah. So something for once again for everybody to think about. Like this may be good if, like you said, like just lots of muskets. If you you don't really want to play with the Stratzi, you can go for the Rekruts, um, and that could be a really good card. And and you know I, I think there's even some potential there with the, like I I remember talking to some people about Milutin reforms and and doing that one time pop where it switches to Northern Musketeers, and you just go crazy. But those are more complicated for a standard. Um, I guess we'll just stick to the two heavy cannon because I feel like that's been pretty baseline. Yeah, that, 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 would, that would be a standard way to do it. And I think for, I don't know, for me, I think I'd like maybe take the six Cossacks out or something like that and fit in either Piotr's Toy Soldiers or the, the Stratlet Combat. I mean, it just kind of depends on how you want to how you want to approach it. Like, this could be like with, I mean, this is maybe like a nice representation of like a game if you want to go pretty heavy on the musketeers like because you have the 13 musks they're in h3 but if you want to do a, a stratlet oriented kind of composition you could take that out put that one in and then the 13 musks in h3 and put um replace it with 19 stratlets i tend to uh, the other reason i think i really don't like to um send stratlets is because like if you send 19 stratlets it, it's so expensive on your population cap yeah you can like sending stratlets can be a real challenge because like you just house yourself um so i i, I just find that really annoying so i, I think that's another reason why i kind of 
do something like this, but again, it depends on kind of how you approach the match and who your opponent is. Okay, um, good to know. So this is, let's just say this is going to be the standard 1v1, um, you know, so it, all the variations, just keep them in mind. I'm just going to leave it as is. You could switch this out for the six cost sack. You know, we, we kind of gone over the spice trade. We've gone over um, at, versus 700 uh, food. We've gone over certain unit shipments. And then of course, H4, there's plenty of options. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, take a picture of this if you need to. Um, I'm, you know, Pete, is there, you know, looking at this deck, how would you modify it to incorporate water? Like if, if I need to get on water, maybe disrupt my opponent's water play. Like, what are some edits that you would make to this deck to make that happen? Um, I would either take out the four Cossacks or 600 gold um, and put two, um, yeah, two of those guys in there. Um, I would maybe take out, like, maybe Piotr's Toy Soldiers and put a Frigate in there if you were really expecting a lot of water play, but if... I, I think I tend to, like, not have the Frigate in there if they're going on water. I'd kind of tend to try to send that... hit that in H2 as opposed to sending a Frigate. And, okay. and just prefer to keep it, it in there, but it, I mean, I don't know, if you're playing, like, ports and they're planning to be pretty heavy on water and you want to contest it, then, you know may want to bring it in there so it, it really just kind of depends on the opponent um the other thing that i like to have in the deck um i take out the two heavy cannons and i actually put schooners in the deck okay so you do go schooners interesting good for a couple of reasons number one just by you having that card in the deck can um like it, it, I think it puts your opponent a little off balance because like then they're like oh is he gonna do a water boom or is he gonna rush me um, um, you can still do your rush kind of like kind of I don't want to call it rush but like early pressure and contain standard build and contain with schooners in your deck um, and the other reason I like it too is because um, you know you're doing your age two kind of fight and whatnot and you find that you have a space to kind of breathe or whatnot you can you've maybe like over macroed on some wood you could drop down two docks send schooners and then it's like you have two more town centers ah uh, okay i see and so it's, it's kind of something that you send kind of into like a late age a late age to it if you feel if you don't feel like you have to go to fortress or i don't think i tend to send it once you get to age three there's kind of too many um kind of high value shipments there in h3 but it's kind of like one that you can you're doing all this suffocating suffocating early pressure and they're building up and then suddenly you kind of pull back and maybe you drop a blockhouse and schooners and just kind of do this boom behind it. Okay. I think it's I think it's something that probably is a little bit more successful in team games in a two v two type of situation where you know your opponent can kind of do a little bit of the military production to give you the space to do that. But uh, in every so often in a one v one, I'm able to do that. Sometimes it's like when all is lost, you've been wiped. Um, opponent thinks you have the game and you have to gamble. Um, you can send that card, build a bunch of boats, and just hope that your opponent <laughs> is just relaxing and just kind of trying to get his perfect military comp before he pushes you. And then by the time he gets to you, you have this, this eco <laughs> with units behind what you're doing. You know? All right. Yeah. Um... Is there, um, so no age two, um, like, uh, like no rending plant? Um, I don't, I don't, I don't kind of bother with that. I mean, uh, like if you, if I think if you're, 
I think if you're going to do go at, on water out right and that's your plan then you can send that like I've seen I think I've seen a Russia player like open like with a TP uh, and go distributive some schooners into rendering plant it was really greedy and his opponent didn't scout him and sent like two towers expecting a rush um i think it was like uh kind of one of those top top ranked players top 100 players i saw that happen in a game that i just happened to observe but i don't it, to me it's like a tip off on what you're doing on on water um you can send eco theory instead, which buffs your villagers and your boats. Okay. I'm kind of really trying to do. Yeah. Trying to do that. I see and your point. The, the, the other thing too is just like, there's just not a lot of space for other shipments in H2 for Russia. Like I want, I want my four Cossacks in there. You know, I want, you know, ideally I'd want 600 gold in there as well. Some, somehow. So like some. So sometimes like. You know you're you're figuring out how to drop one of those cards so that you can have 600 gold in there the eco theory is a less expensive kind of spot in your deck than the rendering plan okay i see um all right so you know not too much of a difference but if anybody's wondering you know this is kind of pete's preferences and he kind of explained his reasonings behind like the philosophy of this deck and so in keeping with that you know here are some water options for you to sort of like if you want to maybe get on the water take advantage of it to economically boom or maybe disturb your opponent especially in h2 this is what you can do um, if you want to look to add the three frigates in h3 you can also opt to do that as well so you can go ahead and take a screenshot of that yeah no. one, one more thought on the rendering plan i just never know like i'd be kind of curious to hear like what the players that use it when they actually like when they send that because i mean it takes a while to get you know a certain number of boats out there like if you have 10 to 15 fishing boats and you're sending rendering plant you're kind of really only getting three to four fishing boats out of that and fishing boats aren't as efficient as at gathering as as like a land villager um so I, I don't know. I just I just find it to be an awkward card because uh, I feel like it, you, usually you don't you, you don't have like kind of like the scale on fishing boats for it to be like a really big payoff at least in terms of build count immediately. I mean, it, basically I just kind of view it as like a super greedy card that you send and try to get away with it. If that makes sense. It does. I mean, it also but it also gives you a 25% on on the whales. So. I guess there could be an argument for like a in 25% increase on on let's say you have let's say three whales that you've taken on a map you know that's three infinite coin mines essentially um between yeah, four fishing yeah. boats so you know I mean there's it's it, it may be one of those things where it's like it's a map dependent higher level play that we're thinking about you know and probably somebody will do the math um Gideon or Dunamai um, and we can ask them. Yeah, I mean, t to me, like, if I've got 20 fishing boats out there happily gathering, I'm probably, my eco's probably great. And right. I and better than the opponents, I don't, I don't need to, like, you know, double down on it, so to speak. I probably need to, like, get units out or something and make sure that I don't just militarily die. Yeah, I mean, there may be, like, a turtling option here, or, like, I mean, it could serve, I, I mean, honestly, like, in more water-dependent maps, it could serve as a sort of marvelous year for whatever Civ is sending this, right? So you have, like, that window in which, like, I mean, the eco just goes crazy, you know? And for Russia, like you said, that food cost, you know, I'm not, like, arguing against it. I'm just thinking, like, you know, with that food cost that you already have, if you're doubling down and it's, like, 30% for fish, in conjunction with like economic theory i mean like you have a pretty insane food income um coming in so i mean there's potential there but like you said it's it, it really comes it's a really a big pacing thing i think you know because anytime you're choosing to send one card you're not su sending another right and that could mean the difference between a win and a loss so i'm not sure 
yeah. but yeah there you go this is your here's a good water option for you i'm gonna go ahead and switch this back to land um so we had the what were we dealing with before i think we had spice trade but you could do 700 food if you wanted and what am i missing am i missing anything out of three i don't think so Um. No, I think we had toy soldiers in there, but you could have, we could have had. Yeah, I think, I think, I think that looks like a deck that I would have. Yeah. Okay, sounds good. All right, so let's let's get into this. So we're gonna. So what we're gonna do next is is I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna head into a skirmish. It's gonna be. We're just gonna demonstrate a land opening. I'm not gonna do any sort of water. Um, because that's just more of build a dock when you can and put boats on it. Um, so I'm going to play on easy so that way the AA doesn't interfere. And Pete, you're going to walk me through step by step how we open playing as Russia. You know, what... sure. do, you, do you want me to just kind of like give you conceptually why you, you try to approach a game this way real quick? Just yeah, sure. So Absolutely. Like, so, I mean, in, in terms of like strengths and weaknesses for russia as a sieve like um the batch training for the bills actually makes uh russia's eco a little bit weaker than uh the other sieves in the game because um you're having three bills in production at the same time so there's a little bit of there's a lot more idle time if you think about it as opposed to like brits that get to pop the villagers out one one at a time and each villager is immediately gathering the second it's it pops out it's taking a little bit longer for those kind of three and q to actually be productive and working so i mean what that means is kind of in the early part of the game you're I'm, I'm, hopefully i'm explaining it well your eco's a bit weaker, but there is an inflection point that because of with the batch training that your villagers are getting produced faster, there is an inflection point where your your eco will actually catch up and then eventually outscale the other sieves in the game, if that makes sense. Because you're mm -hmm. in terms of quantity, you're they're getting produced faster, but you're just getting more idle time uh, with each batch of bills that you're training. If that makes sense. Did that come across okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm tracking. I'm tracking. It just it, you're saying is this it takes a little bit while. It takes a little while for you to ramp up just because of the fact that you're batch training and also like you have to anticipate like in terms of macro, the food cost up front, although per unit is cheaper, you're gathering more to pay, you know, for because you have to train all three at once. So that creates yeah. some sort of difficulty. Yeah, that's another consideration. And so kind of what Kind of, if, kind of your grand strategy, so to speak, as you're approaching these games, is you're trying to figure out a way to like contain your opponent's early eco that can outscale you a little, like faster if it's not left unchecked. And generally, how you're trying to do that with Russia is militarily. So you're trying, you really want to be like constantly brawling. As Russia or forcing your opponent to send a military shipment instead of the eco card that it wants to send in so if you're playing Sweden if you can force Sweden to send two other cannons instead of ironworks uh, maybe it's tougher for you militarily at that point but you're keeping uh, Sweden's economic boom under control in a way that you can outscale your opponent and um, uh, I guess the other um, objective for you is um, there's a lot of civs that want to get to Fortress quickly. You want to keep the game in age two. Like Russia, like well, generally speaking, is like one of the strongest, if not the strongest, age two civ in the game. If the game were only played in age two, so you want to be del delaying your opponent's um, flick up to age three as as long as possible. 
or if they do click up, you want to hit them with the timing so that by the time they get to age three, that the game's kind of already been won because you've already taken out too much of their eco or you've kind of overwhelmed them with units. Okay, gotcha. All right, so that's our general game plan. We want to keep the game in age two and just be anticipate, anticipating that, that high food cost. So I'm going to go ahead and get it on Lithuania. Uh, it's a nice map. I feel like it's got a lot of options, choke points and things like that. Probably decent for Russia. So we're going to go ahead and get into it. I'm going to hit play on this one. And you're, you're going to just walk me through, you know, step by step exactly what I need to be doing. So that way we can properly demonstrate a opening build order. So I'm going to load into here. It's going to be a random. I'm not going to bother too much with the treasures. We're just going to be focusing in on, on the build as soon as this is able to get going. Pick up your valves and get them on the food right away. Yeah, that's pretty good. Okay, so then we can see already 260, right? For three. So cheaper. You can crack and get that wood treasure. Are we doing treasures or I I'm going to try to avoid it. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. It's a little tricky because, like, treasures are really important. Right. For Russia early because like their early game goes so weird so yeah you'll want to heard that and you'll want to build a house right away because you're going to get popped do i need to put anybody on wood um no you do not okay do i go market with the extra 100 or uh, I bank it? Only, only if you find 50 gold or 50 wood in your okay in your I see. Base. otherwise otherwise you don't do so it. like in this case we could have yeah i think if you find 50 gold or 50 wood, then you chop it out and build the market immediately. Okay. Strong players not from a true to build military gene. Wood on the ground. You should have brought a real army. So like the, because the idea is to get hunting dogs right away. So. Right. Yeah. To improve your your gather rate. Okay, so, so this is good. Your deck has spice trade in it, so like we'll see if you're short on food for the batch training at that point. So do I age up with 14 vils or 17? Um, depends on the circumstance, but I would say mostly you're going to do 14. They'll okay. age up. Um, but I think it, um, uh, it should be said that, um, yeah, 17 village up will be late for Russia, but Russia is, is uniquely qualified to be able to do something like that because they can build their blockhouse in age one and in fact in team games, I pretty much 99% of the time do a 17 village up because of that in 2v2s. So you had already said earlier distributivism is going to be the first card, yep. so just go ahead and, and send that in. That's going to give us that wood trickle. Germany is typically a very difficult matchup for Russia. I would imagine so, because the Ulan and you need to deal with their their cav. Yeah, they just are able to get up to fortress very fast. Oops. Oh, nice back herd there. Yeah, I mean, you'll see it. But you've already got your close um, out. Like it's not uncommon for Russia to be a little bit idled in age one, but um, kind of at the end. Uh, but the way you can help that is, of course, by finding food treasures. And then if you kind of at the start just really heard your hunts in really tight to your town center so that there's no walking space for when your villagers pop from the town center that's a way that you and 400 would yeah 400 would, 400 would yeah all right what do i do here in the transition you can send two villagers forward i would do it to that gold mine in the middle of the map there yeah there okay and put your villagers um shift half of the half of them to wood you want to be able to Готов. 
Okay, that's a good spot for it. Yeah, we're getting pretty close here. So, and then 250, so we'll probably just set these guys to chop. We'll probably get there in a second. Yeah, we'll try and put it on the side or maybe in front of the mine. Or maybe you put it behind it so that it's tougher to siege. Yeah. Okay. So you always want two on the military. Yeah, and I like to chop. I, I like to chop enough wood to build a house. Okay. But then, but you need to get everybody to all right, move four soldiers to gold. Right now. Yeah, no treasure is going to be tough to get muskets out. Build a house. And get everybody to food. You get everybody to food. That's be enough. Yeah. I see. Just for the mill. Two bills. Yep. Yeah, have that one bill collect. Okay. And then ship five Cossacks. So if this is your shipment point, here's the button for shipment point, here's the button for economic, yeah. so there you go. Yeah, I would put those two bills on the hunt right there. Okay. Should I queue up some strelets? No, no, we're going to make a musk. Okay. So we need 95 coin for that, so yeah, everybody yeah. just keep aware of the... Yeah, so, and usually, the, you know, finding the treasure somewhere in there. Go build another house with one of your food bills. Yeah, and even if you had found some minor treasure in that it would have allowed you to reallocate more bills to gold earlier or whatnot. Are your Cossacks around? Mm -hmm. push, him, push him into the base, scream him ahead, put your muskets in, queue up your next back, so the musks, and something's wrong here because like we don't have enough food. I think here. I queued, I queued another. Yeah, that's fine. You can do the eco, so like, I, I, I'm more kind of eco, so you go in there and... Oh, that's what the issue is, is you have your villagers queued to the gold, you only want four on the gold. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah, so you, you only want four on gold and everybody else going to gold. So you can see how quickly, like, how You're tight in. Your, ma your macro has to be. I see. And so, like, you only want four. I think it's four on gold. You have two idols. Um, Even I am slightly surprised that you have been so poor at collecting treasure. You really just kind of want to be in there, kind of harassing from the outside. You want to be careful not to get too close. Um... You want to be careful not to get too close. It's on 700 wood now. 700? Yeah, 700 wood. So, like, you're in there, you're pressuring. You want to kind of be in there harassing. Like, it's great if you are able to kill some of their military units, and, like, in a good trade, or, like, kill a bill. But if you're even just, like, idling them, like, sometimes that's, that's good enough. You're in there, you're swirling around, you're, you're raiding them. 700 wood is coming in. Um... And with that 700 wood, like you're gonna have the bills, build a second block house. So this raid will ha hardly ever happen in a game if you're actually playing on the 1v1, but... Yeah, I mean, it's just like a little tricky. It's like, you know, an easy AI. Yeah, yeah. Usually it's a little more interesting. The player is walled up. They've got a outpost tower. It's really important for you to keep your Cossacks alive because you're just gonna be making muskets here. Um, now you built a market, so get your hunting dogs, right? Okay. So he's gathering up that uh, wood now. So now you can build a second block house, build a stable and base. Okay. So we want these guys to go ahead and just build that forward block house like you're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, build it right next to Got it. Build a stable and base. Still making your muskets. Make a house. So here, like, I think we talked about sending spice trade, but I think you should actually send 700 gold because, and just um, get all your bills on your food um, because what you'll see, like, that's going to allow you to do. And, like, this is where the 700 wood, 700 food option comes in. Oh, I see what you mean. Oh, uh, okay, so then here I could be the 700 food and then I can really like up the yeah, yeah yeah you have enough gold like so now you can double batch mu muskets like i see and so like 
and it allows you to, to so you built all these buildings it allows you to make stuff out of all of them and so what you can do if you can't double batch muskets batch a musk and then queue a kazak one of the great things about kazaks is um, uh, they're they're only one pop and they're really cheap so sometimes like you have you know, everything is batch training. You can't afford to make any infantry, but you can't afford to queue a Kazakh, so you should queue a Kazakh. Oh, I see. Yeah, and you've pulled all your units back, and maybe that's what that's what it that's what's called for. But you, you should be kind of constantly be pushing in, pushing out, kind of seeing if you can exploit any kind of like weakness in their armor, so to speak. And. As you can see, if like you feel like kind of like on a unit basis, if they kind of have the advantage there, you just pull back to your blockhouse, and it's pretty difficult for them to take out that forward base. I see. Okay, so now I picked Exile Prince. Is that okay? Um. Oh, you're aging. Yeah, that's another thing you can do. It's like if you feel like you've done enough damage, you can go to age three. Um. The other thing is with that 700 wood. Um, like you, like you could also have been um, Trade line. building TPs. There's like six TPs here. Like you could have just been using your explorer to build all those TPs and like just, I, you know, I mean, if you've done enough damage, you can go to H3 or if you want to like push him with dogs, maybe he's laid down a big wall with a tower and you can't really push more than a higher age. With Russia, I think like you can really superior patience make a. Uh, make a living just pushing in H2 constantly, like staying in H2. Right, so, so I could have chosen four Cossacks instead, right, just to have even Not more. Not even. I, I usually ship the resource shipments. Oh, okay. Just, uh, like, so, so, like, if I had 700 food, and if I had sent that, then I would have sent the 700 gold. And then, you know, it r really, like, I feel like, um, as Russia... Unless you have a big lead, you should be following your opponent up to Fortress as opposed to the other way around. Because like I said, you don't have any shadow teched units really except for a Cav Archer to make an H3. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. Because everything else has to be upgraded. Yeah, um, I guess Opri. You can make Opri. Yeah. But, like, so, but like you can... You can kind of it does see. Not like, take a genius um, to recognize I yeah, I mean, defeated. we're just doing a basic I demonstration, but resign. you can see kind of how tight you have to be on like the macro. So that's why like getting early treasures is like really critical. So like finding a food treasure that can help you have an idol is um, age up to two. Really, really important. If you can't get um, can't get that, then you know getting the wood treasures, which um, kind of help you get your blockhouse earlier and put the bills on gold a little bit earlier, so that you can get that batch of musks out a little bit earlier than we did. Um, all that at all that adds up are like getting that treasure in base, so that you can build the market and get hunting dogs right away, because otherwise you're usually waiting for the 700 wood to get your market up. Like the, the the macro has to be like really, really tight between the batch training and just how weak your early eco is. I see. Yeah, and it and it really comes with also like understanding like well, what does it cost? You know, like, um, you know, because understanding you know how much a unit costs because it's not it's no longer the standard one at a time. It's gonna be right the batch. So that's like a key. That's such a key thing that like you have to know like okay, I need the two eighty one ninety five. Like that's a different kind of number. That we're dealing with, so I I, so I shipped two Falks in the meantime. I mean, because I didn't have them surrender because I you were talking and and yeah, yeah. No, you know we fine. and I went and got the upgrade because we want to you want to try to upgrade these I imagine pretty quickly just to get them to a, just a a viable point. So then from here I guess it's just dependent on the game, right? Like, what yeah. you want to do? Yeah, exactly. Okay too easy okay so i feel like that's pretty standard so just to kind of um let's go ahead and um let's just take a look um well actually i don't know if i can get him to surrender <laughs> um okay. but uh yeah let's go ahead and just uh quit out of this hey, you want to look at 
the post game or anything, or I don't know it. Oh, I was just gonna go over the order of things. So, yeah. Um, so in this in this case, um, as you showed, you know, obviously, like we didn't go over treasures or anything, but the the early treasures are super important, right? Like getting that early market if you can, getting hunting dogs if you can find the coin treasure, um, and, you know, get the corresponding wood. That's gonna be super important. So something to be looking out for. Early block house, right? So all vills on food, and then you're gonna want a house right away. And then you're gonna age up, you're gonna go quartermaster, um, and you're gonna be chopping, you're gonna split your bills, food and wood. And then you're gonna wanna get that early block house, 250 wood, build it in age one, build it forward, set it as your military shipment point, get your Cossacks in, five Cossack. Um, so for, sorry, first card is distributivism, that'll also help with your wood cost. Five Cossacks coming in, and then you're gonna follow up with either Wreck Rut or Streltsy, just depending on what's needed. And so and then you're going to macro accordingly. In this case, it was the rec rut. So what did you say? Only four on coin. Everybody else on food is really all you need. Get market, get your market text, get hunting dog. If you can get place your mines, do that. Um, and then eventually you're going to go 700 wood. So distributivism, five cost sack. And then we went 700 wood. And that's going to, this gives you so much flexibility, right? So you're going to get your stable you and get a second block house, multiple houses. And the goal is to just keep like keep the macro going you know keep building houses with your wood shipments 700 wood 600 wood so that way you can just keep pushing uh units out and just staying in h2 like you said keeping the pressure on your opponent as you get more and more bills out so that way the economic curve goes in your favor and you can switch out the spice tray for that 700 food and the 700 food will give you two batches of rec rut so that's another 10 muskets on the field or plenty of strelets you can get 20 strelets on the field so yeah um, and i think i think you saw from this game that like Sending spice trade as your third shipment is just it's a little bit too early because you need you just need the res to be able to pump out units. So like I, I think the way I did it before I considered the seven hundred um food card. Mm -hmm. It was kind of like exactly what we did in that game. Like it was distributivism, um, five Cossacks, and then 700 wood where you build it and then I would shift all my bills to, to food before sending the 700 gold I'd like maybe queue a Cossack and a batch of muskets and I try to like keep all the production buildings pumping and so I mean if you think about it at that point in the game like your opponent may be trying to go to h3 but it like if you're pump if you're pumping out five Cossacks and 10 to 15 muskets and in addition to like the army that you already have you can have like a really strong timing push like from kind of when you get in there um or maybe they haven't or or, or maybe you like kind of get in there they see their you see their force and they send a military shipment i mean sometimes just forcing them to send iran and a shipment that kind of keeps them in h2 longer it all it all works to your advantage so like you saw your eco's weak early but as long as you're able to keep your vill production constant but where you're where you're at a point where you're not having to, to constantly cut bills you'll get to like a point in the game where you have 35 38 bills you've sent a lot of shipments in age two you're not really sure what to send so you can just send eco theory and suddenly your age one card becomes a pretty nice um Hard where you're getting four bills, you're going to be at 44 bills where it's soon, where it's going to be four and a half bills, and it'll just keep scaling. And your opponent will have a really tough time kind of breaking out of that chokehold of like block houses that you've surrounded uh, their their base with. They'll start running out of natural resources. What you really want to be doing is just kind of really containing them, taking the map control. Um, you're laying down infrastructure, you know, TPs here and there, so you're gonna have great line of sight on being able to protect your eco from kind of like any raids coming in the back. I mean, a lot of times that's like uh, what your opponent has to like resort to doing to be rushes coming around the back of you with like us to, to kill three or four, four bills. And if you kind of, as you see, kind of with like how tight the macro is with Russia, that can be kind of like game ending for you. Yeah. Um, another thing to be thinking about, like, you know, I know that's a lot. It's a lot of information Pete's laying down, but 
Another thing to think about it is like you said, you, you know, when I was pushing in, you want to harass your opponent. You don't want to necessarily take any sort of unfavorable fight. You have to remember your units are just inherently weaker because they're easier to mass. So just because you think like, well, I got 10 muskets on the field, they can get wiped pretty easy. So really fight in numbers. So you want to kind of Pete's pointing out that you need the economy to get the units pumped out because the whole point is to get a big mass. And so you want to keep them in H2 and then eventually you land the knockout blow because you just have so many more units that they can't really hold you back. You know, so don't think that just because, all right, well, I got five Cossack and I got 10 Rec Ruts, you know, I'm in a really good spot now. Yeah, you put your opponent on the back foot, sure, you maybe have delayed them, but just understand that those units are outclassed. So you need to keep adding to the mass, you need to keep on the opponent, you need to keep the military production going. They're not high quality units. So just another thing to be reminded of um, goes without saying so um, cool I you know I is there anything else that you'd like to add about about Russia um, that somebody needs to be thinking about that's that's new um, or do you feel like you've you've covered all of it um, I think um, you know just wanted to make a couple of comments on the units um, we talked about the Stratlet a little bit briefly you know, 10 wood and 37 food is like one of the cheapest units in the game, but the reason why it's considered so strong, if you can afford to make it part of your military comp, is that if you think about like a, a ton of its efficiency comes in, uh, and for all Russian units for that matter, but especially for the Stratlet and how cheap it is. So if they, if you're playing, you know, Dutch and He's got 15 skirms, and this 15 skirms unload into the nearest stretlet to them. I mean, a tremendous amount of overkill into that one stretlet that the Dutch player had. Meanwhile, kind of you have this overwhelming mass of um, of cheap units that are firing everywhere. Maybe not necessarily killing everything on the first shot, but every shot is counting it's not getting wasted and overkill with your unit so that's a big st strength for the sieve if that makes sense is kind of it can be overwhelming for your opponent to micro just this huge mass of units and if they're not careful they can just kind of overkill a lot of your units uh, my favorite unit in the game is the cossack um it's 75 food and 75 wood for that um or excuse me 75 food and 75 gold and even better it's only uh one uh pop space which pop space is pretty uh, precious as russia with the batch training and uh i, b I don't believe this has changed but even an unupgraded kazakh one-on-one -on -one beats an ulhan in h2 um, because it has more HP. Okay. Um, the challenge, of course, with Germany is just they're able to usually mass a lot more cav than you are as Russia. But on a pound for pound basis, that unit is incredible. And um, going into the late game, if your opponent isn't careful about producing guns, you can get an overwhelming number of Cossacks out onto onto the onto the map if that makes sense it does of how cheap they are and how efficient they are for pop space it's one of the best units in the game um let's see what else can i think about here with uh in terms of units um i think kind of those are the two more important things sure. right now the poor chicks I, i'm not a fan of those in h2 um but was the one that pointed out that you know you get a batch of four halberdiers in h2 the siege is basically the same that you have in a batch of five muskets you know four four halberdiers versus five muskets and your your muskets have a range attack yeah so i just want muskets to be a little bit more practical yeah. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of uh, 
what else? Um, well, in either case, I mean, like, if, you know, it doesn't all have to be here, you know, like, um, um, we, you know, anybody can find you on the Discord, right? I mean, you're, uh, you're Purple Pete, right? On Sumbro's Discord. Yeah, I got renamed that because I'm colorblind, apparently. Oh. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> can't see the color purple, but um, uh, but Pistol Pete, yeah, in game name. I don't know if you want. I can kind of give you theories for kind of like some fancy builds that people have with uh, with Russia, like the eight fast industrial northern musketeer, and then there's also the um, kind of fast fortress converting all your strutlets into muskets and doing the timing like that Ooh. Um, yeah but uh, um I, I i've never actually used these builds but like you know a's and i've seen people on the ladder kind of yeah use this we can definitely and, do um know, sorry and, the, and and then kind of the other thing that i think people do is they send that cheap priest card in h2 Mm -hmm. uh, which makes your priests like 50% uh, cost and the priest heals units and just has a ton of HP and you just kind of throw them into the fight and uh, kind of it makes it difficult for your opponent to micro your actual military units and they just kind of act as these big tanks interesting and yeah I, I mean it's bizarre like I, I think I actually watched like a 1500 1600 elo game russia dutch the russia player like looked <laughs> looked to me dead like did an all-in you know like didn't do the kind of suffocating build that we did here it was uh distributivism into five cossacks four cossacks you know had no eco behind it and he sent that cheap ch cheap priest card and made a bunch of priests and just sent a bunch of Cossacks and uh, you know other units and the the Dutch player wasn't able to like it's crazy didn't know what to do with all these like high HP priests <laughs> and the Russian player was able to win I mean I was definitely a throw on the on the Dutch players part but like you know in certain cases you know things yeah. like that can be done wild I don't encourage it I don't think that's good for the game that <laughs> Okay, well, I mean, there's definitely um, there's definitely a lot of things that you can you can do with Russia. Um, there's obviously like plenty of strategies here, um, and we'll definitely revisit the Civ. I mean, I, I really hope to. Um, you know, obviously we have the Discord. You guys can come in and see the builds that we're creating. Um, check us out. We'll have a link in the description where you can meet Purple Pete in person. He's a nice guy. You can talk to him. He's he's always floating around, and and you know we'll have guides posted, and, and hopefully we'll we'll kind of return to more videos where we can kind of go over more specific build orders. Um, but in terms of uh, an, a, a Russian guide to get you guys started, I think that about wraps it up. Hopefully this was a very educational piece for you guys. Hopefully this was uh, it, it was able to demonstrate the opening build order pretty effectively and, and kind of give you a, a sort of basic understanding of the sieve going forward. So have fun uh, tearing up the ladder with this. Um, you know, stay, keep your opponent in H2, you stay in H2, and we can all just become big time H2 enjoyers no more. Fast Fortress, no more Fast Industrial. Let's go back to um, good old H2 fighting it out, just pure violence. So thank you so much, Pete, for joining me on this Civ Spotlight. I really appreciate you lending your expertise and all your sort of intricate knowledge on the Civ. And thank you guys so much for listening. And we will see you in the next one.